Welcome to Prophecy Countdown. I'm Pastor Ken, and the title of my message today is number 393, The Risky Realm of the Rich. And we'll be looking at a few verses in Matthew chapter 19. Now, as the name of our podcast implies, uh, all of our podcasts typically have a prophecy thread. You know, more than 25% of the Bible is, is prophecy. And it's not unusual for us to stumble across prophecy uh, when we're going through a book of the Bible or actually anywhere in the Bible. Um, if you have questions, we love answering questions, particularly related to prophecy. In fact, that's how we get a lot of our t- ideas for topics, uh, particularly, particularly on our Wednesday updates. If you have a question or an idea for a topic, send us an email at prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. I answer all of those emails myself and uh, would love to be able to answer your question as well. So let's go ahead and get started. We are in uh, update number 393, the risky realm of the rich. Hope you appreciate that alliteration. And we're in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. You know, this uh, the scripture that we're looking at today is, is an encounter that Jesus had with one who was commonly called the rich young ruler. You've likely heard sermons on it, just as I have. And we have the benefit with this encounter that it's actually um, in three of the gospel accounts, the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm going to read it to you, of course, from Matthew, and then we'll develop and illustrate the inherent risks and the dangers associated uh, with wealth. So let's start off in uh, chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven, and come, follow me. But the young man heard that saying, and, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowfully, for he had great possessions. Now, all three of the gospel narratives of this encounter between Jesus and this rich young ruler, this story in all three of the accounts is sandwiched between Jesus blessing the little children. Remember, he says, let the children come to me, do not hinder them. Um, And um, the simile, uh, it's a figure of speech where Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So here we can see how important it is to look at the context of the verses we're unpacking as the context of this rich young ruler is is found between the the childlike faith that's necessary as well as the deceitfulness of riches at the end of the chapter. So let's continue. I've identified three risks associated with riches um, that will build our case for the risky realm of the rich. Okay, risk number one is the risk of relying on discipline. The scripture references Matthew chapter 19, verse 20. All of these I have kept, what do I still lack? You know, the two things we know about this rich man, there are two things. The first thing is that he is, he's rich. Uh, the scriptures tell us that he had great wealth. It was because of his riches that he turned away from the offer of Jesus to sell everything that he had, give to the poor, and follow him. Now, the second thing we know about the rich man is that he has kept all of the commandments. When he says this, Jesus doesn't disagree with him, but the man is relying on his disciplined adherence to the law. While we know that strict discipline to the moral law will not get you into the heaven, The one thing we often don't realize is that that kind of discipline, that kind of adherence to your own self-worth and your own discipline can actually keep you out of heaven. 
Now, I'm a person that believes in discipline. I, I did well in school. And I can tell you, it wasn't because I was smarter than the rest, but I was disciplined. I at least showed up. Woody Allen once said in a movie, showing up is 80% of life, and then he continues this, sometimes it's easier to hide home in bed, and I've done both. Well, I, I agree with Woody Allen. Um, I was disciplined. Some stay in bed and slumber. Others find the discipline to get up and show up. They do the hard work. They stick with it. They know that there are certain responsibilities that come with life. In fact, and here's a truism, there are no professionals that don't understand discipline, hard work, whether it's professional athletes, doctors, attorneys, CEOs of major corporations, or even army rangers. All, all of them understand that it means to have, they have to have the discipline to do the hard work, to stick it out, with, and, they, and they have to be able to do something well in order to master it. Uh, the rich young ruler may have inherited his wealth. We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. But he has the discipline that makes other people successful. He's the one that said to Jesus, I have kept all of these things, these, these commandments of God. What do I lack? While he was talking about the moral law, he could just have easily could have been talking about every aspect of his life. See, the people that rely on discipline, people that are highly disciplined, often rely on discipline for literally, literally every aspect of their life. However, just like the disciplined gunfighter in the Old West, there's always going to be someone that's faster. This young man was asking Jesus what he lacked, what was lacking, what, what did he need to master, what was the talent that he still needed to learn. And this is, of course, is how a disciplined person took, takes a look at life, but it's a risky belief. If you believe that discipline will only get you there because, will get you there because it will only get you part way. Talent only gets you so far. You know, he asked the right question, what shall I do that I may have? Now in the Gospel of Luke, it says, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life. I love that word inherit because that identifies the, ide the idea of a testament, of a last will and testament. Somebody dies and as a result you inherit something. And that's actually a better way of looking at the kingdom of God. It's the right question. But this rich young ruler was not going to be happy with the answer that Jesus gave. Let's go on to risk number two. Risk number two I've identified as believing that personal discipline and following rules makes you better. And I'll go further than that, I'll say better than the rest. Verse 20, I mentioned before, he replied, all these things I've kept from my youth. Basically the man's saying, I've done it. I've disciplined myself, I keep the Sabbath, I, I'm not like the others. They may fail, but, but where they fail, I have succeeded. Now we all know people I'm sure you know people that think they are better than everyone else. Uh, they're usually easy to spot because they have their noses in the air. They can be dismissive and even rude to those that they don't believe are on the same uh, social class or, or the same category, uh, the same rank that they are. Now, unfortunately, and I want you to listen to this, a lot of us are just like that. Maybe not to the same extent, and perhaps we don't telegraph our superiority, but we often think that we're better than at least not the rest, at least the most. And of course, we have plenty to show for it. Like this rich young ruler, we are likely dressed a little better. We live in a nice house. We've disciplined ourselves so that, we've, that we keep a good paying job. Uh, even, if it, even if it means working for crummy bosses or long hours. You know, we've done the homework. We put in the hours, and now we are able to live comfortably. We may not consider ourselves to be rich, but in reality, if you're an American, you're likely living better than 90% of the rest of the people in the world. And what got us there? Well, if we think about it for a moment, we honestly think that it's, uh, it's our discipline. It's, it's our hard work. We've, we've earned our way to where we are. Now, here's the thing. God doesn't, doesn't look at us that way. He, he loved us be thought we, before we thought we were so special. He loved us 
just as much as as the ones he loves just the ones that succeed just as much as the ones that that fail remember that jesus died for all of us including the sinners and we're all sinners and the sinners that struggle and never have anything of substance like the blind beggars that came to jesus for for healing the bible tells us that we are to be humble in the epistle of john chapter 4 it says humble yourself in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up you know, self-discipline can lead to success, but here's the thing, success can often lead to pride, and pride ultimately leads to a fall. Here's a scary verse, it's in the same, uh, it's the same uh, chapter uh, of, of the gospel, or the epistle of James, and it's the idea of the sin of pride. Um, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I, I don't know about you, but I don't want the, uh, my discipline, my self-reliance lead to a pride that God resists. I, like all of us, need God's grace. Risk number three, the risk of relying on goodness. Our scripture references Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus says, why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who is good. Now the young man approaches Jesus um, asking what good deed he must do, but he addresses Jesus with the words, good teacher. Jesus, of course, knows where this conversation is going. He, he knows this man. In the, the companion verse in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 10, it says Jesus, looking at him, loved him. But this rich young ruler was thinking that goodness was something that was earned, something that was visible. You know, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a teacher. Many believed him to be the Messiah. Certainly rabbis, especially this man named Jesus, who many believed to be the Messiah, was, was good. Just as the rich man thought that he was good. Likely his thinking was similar to the Pharisees and, quite frankly, most of the Jews at the time, most of us, that goodness comes from keeping the law. However, Jesus quickly responded, why do you ask me about what is good? Only, there's only one who is good. God's standards are high, higher than our standards and higher than anyone can attain through discipline, through hard work, and even through riches. Jesus is going to demonstrate that perfection related to the law keeping actually means giving everything that you have away. Now this is not an attitude of the rich man. Uh, this is what this is. What, this didn't set too well with the rich man. And before we're too critical of the rich man, most of us are comforted that Jesus has never asked us to sell everything that we have and give it to the poor. In the next few verses, even the disciples will chime in. What about us? We've given up everything. This encounter ends sadly, this encounter between Jesus and the rich young ruler. Jesus tells him this, he says, sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. The last verse, verse 22 says, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You know, the rich young man was relying on the law. Jesus told him that if he wanted to be perfect from the perspective of the law, he was to give it all up, to gain treasure in heaven. However, his attachment to his wealth prevented him from truly following Jesus. Did you realize that this man walked away, what he walked away from? I, was, I know that selling whatever he had and giving it all up was a pretty high hurdle, but Jesus told him, follow me. You know, I've reached the, researched the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, and Jesus says, follow me to only a few. I have listed them here for you in, as, in our close. Uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Uh, Jesus calls these fishermen to follow him. They immediately leave their nets and they follow Jesus. And then there's Matthew, also called Levi. Jesus calls Matthew, a tax collector, to follow him. And Matthew leaves his tax booth and follows Jesus. And then there's Philip. In the Gospel of John, Jesus finds Philip and says, follow me, and Philip follows him. You know, Jesus loved this rich young ruler and offered him, get this, a spot at the table. Remember, this is the 11th hour. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, to the cross. 
the other apostles have been following him for three years. Just think if this rich young ruler had said yes. My friends, don't depend on your discipline. Don't depend on your riches. Don't depend on your goodness. All of these, my friends, are the risky realms of the rich. Let's pray. So Father God, we wanna thank you, Lord, today for this. Uh, Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Baer's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today. Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Baer. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.